Welcome to a very special episode of the Present Fathers Podcast. We have Joel Berry with us from the Babylon Bee. Joel is the managing editor from the Babylon Bee. And in this episode, we go through a whole bunch of different topics that are very interesting and a lot of humor in this one. Um, go figure, a satire writer is funny. But Joel walks us through his story, kind of how he got started with the Babylon Bee, some of his background, and then we dive into topics like pop culture, some crazy things Elon Musk has said recently, as well as a whole bunch of different topics around fatherhood and how to raise your kids well. So you're really going to love this episode. We're really honored that Joel joined us, and uh, we really want you to enjoy this one as well. And before you enjoy this episode, if you haven't heard of the Babylon Bee, do yourself a favor. Go check out thebabylonbee.com first and uh, educate yourself on their humor. They just mock a lot of what's going on in our world today in a very, very hilarious manner. And it's just great stuff. So if you haven't heard of them, go check them out before you listen to this. Otherwise, you might be a little bit lost. And also check out our brand new Present Fathers shop where we have awesome merchandise, shirts, uh, hats, we got journals, coffee mugs, all kinds of stuff. So check it out. Uh, it's a great way for you to support what we're doing um, and also get some amazing merchandise in the process. So without further ado, let's dive into the episode. And thank you all for all the continued support. We love you all. We couldn't do this without you. Welcome to the Present Fathers Podcast. This is the show that focuses on climbing the mountain of fatherhood together. We believe that dads matter. That's why this show is for you. So gear up, dads. Get ready. It's time to start climbing. We have a very special guest tonight, Mr. Joel Berry of the Babylon Bee. Joel, welcome to the show. How are you? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we are uh, We're kind of geeking out over here. It's like Christmas came <laughs> early for us this year. But uh, let, me, let me do a quick little bio for you, and you can fill in all the gaps that I might miss, and uh, okay. then we'll kick it off from there if that's okay with you. So you are a self-described grumpy dad. Um, you're the managing editor of the Babylon Bee. Um, you were a Marine Corps, you were in the Marine Corps, you, uh, left the military, moved to kind of a remote lifestyle in a cabin, right? And then, uh, <laughs> eventually were convinced to join the Babylon Bee. You're the author of the postmodern Pilgrim's Pro Progress and, um, critically acclaimed Guide to Wokeness, which I just so happened to have oh, right nice. there. Nice. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. So what did I miss? <laughs> No, that's pretty much it. No, I uh, well before the B, I was in uh, corporate supply chain sales, so that's a, probably a very important. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I missed I was, that. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, no, I. Um, it's it's funny. There's a, we have a lot of corporate former corporate sales guys that are now writing for the B. I don't know what it is about sales, but um, uh, I was very miserable in that job, um, and I always kind of felt like I was meant to be doing something different. And, uh, the, the way I, so I, we were kind of talking a little bit before we started recording, but I, I met my wife in college, um, after the military, uh, we got married after I graduated, um, immediately started having kids and it was kind of like, I never really, um, you know, had a, a strong vision for what I wanted to do or, or really knew what I was good at. So I just kind of, it was like, I was married, I was having kids. It's like, I just need to make money. So like, I'm just going to grab the first good opportunity that, that comes my way. And, um, oh, hi, Justin. Hey, sorry. Um, and, uh, and so I, I just kind of fell into this, this corporate world. I, I had an aviation degree and from, from school and I, I got into supply chain logistics and I did that for like almost 10 years. And, um, uh, I, I kind of came to a breaking point, um, where I was, I, I was, kind of failing in my career, um, miserable in my job. My wife was tired of seeing me come home, like just with my shoulders slumped, um, just defeated every day. And, um, we kind of just started talking about things, you know, some of my dreams and all the things that I thought about. And, um, she, she told me that she wants, she's like, I want your eyes to look the way they look right now. I want them to look that way all the time you know, cause she saw a fire in, in there. And so she said, you should take a year off, uh, from this corporate job. And she was a nurse. She said, I'll pull extra shifts and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pay the bills for a year. Um, and you figure, figure your life out. So I, I, I did that. I, uh, I 
built an office in my basement, put up a, a couple walls, built an office in a, in a studio. I started a podcast. I started a blog and a satire site. I started um, uh, writing op-eds for different newspapers in the area, um, you know, speaking engagements, just kind of whatever I could do. I would, uh, all I knew is that I had all these thoughts in my head and I really wasn't sure how to express them or how to get them out. Um, but uh, at some point in, you know, during that time, I discovered the Babylon Bee. So <laughs> the Babylon Bee, I remember I was just scrolling through Facebook and um, I saw this headline and the headline was um, Holy Spirit unable to move through congregation after the fog machine breaks. And um, <laughs> I was like, I remember that one. <laughs> like, what is this? That was one of the very early uh, headlines. One of the very first, like, the, like first or second week of the Babylon Bee's existence. And, I think like a lot of people, I really latched onto it because suddenly for the very first time, it was like, what? These are like Christian conservatives who are funny. Like that's unheard of, you know? Right. <laughs> and they and they came from the Christian world. And so they got us, but they also didn't hate us. And, um, and they could poke fun at Christians in a very good natured way. And so I was like, this is amazing. I became an instant fan. And so um, during that year where I was kind of writing and doing all this other stuff, I kind of on the side started um, pitching ideas, headlines to the Babylon Bee on occasion. And they started publishing them. And that kind of snowballed. And I started doing more and more. And then Kyle Mann, the editor-in-chief, um, started having me write articles. And then, you know, a couple of times he was off, off on vacation and he asked me to run the site while he was gone. And then that, like, eventually he called me and said, like, you're kind of working for us full time. We should probably just make this official and, and turn you into the managing editor. So that, that was... Um, that was probably almost four years ago now that that happened. And, um, yeah, I've, I've been living the dream ever since. And, uh, yeah. I work, I work from home. I'm in my garage right now. And, uh, yeah, I get to get to be with the kids and be with the wife and the chickens and whatever other animals are running around here. And it's, it's awesome. Yeah. That's super cool. Can I circle back to with your wife? That's just so incredible that, yeah, you know, she was willing one she recognized just in you because I think um, it just shows like how strong your marriage is, right? For her to have that yes. much awareness of like how you were struggling in your in your current work, um, can you just like highlight maybe some some more of that the relationship details there because that, I th that's a yeah. really good thing that I think um, you know men need to hear like how to confide in your wife about those types of things too. Yeah, well, you know I. I one thing that I've always really appreciated about my wife, and this is something that she kind of taught me. Um, my wife is the most honest and upfront person in the world. Um, and I, I, I know a lot of women aren't like that. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, she, she is very clear in her communication with me and she tells me what she's feeling. And, um, we, we fight a lot, but we always resolve it, you know, uh, we're both the firstborn. We we both kind of have these strong personalities, I think, and but we we always kind of resolve the conflict, and and um, um, we've always been best friends, you know, and and we've always just loved spending time with each other. Um, I think, you know, when we first met, I think what she was a, one of the things she was attracted to me to in me was uh, she I, I think she kind of saw this like this passion and I was kind of this starry eyed like I had all these ideas and things deep things that I thought about and she thought that was really cool and and I think she kind of saw that get squelched um as I was working this nine to five and I was working you know it was like an hour commute I was driving up to Detroit every day my my pickup truck and coming back late and um I was never a very good, good sales guy um, and, uh, you know, um, I think, she, you know, I, she, I, it took a while. I mean, she, it, it took years of me kind of just doing my duty, I think, um, to where she trusted me that, um, I was going to, I was going to take care of our family, you know, even if there was some uncertainty there. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I always tried to, you know, put my family first and myself last. Um, and, and I think that I, 
she had that trust in me um, that if it, you know, a few months in, if it wasn't working and, and I was failing my family that I would, no questions asked, I would go back to sales if that's what I had to do, you know? Um, but, um, yeah, she's, I mean, she, I give all, I give her the credit for all this. I mean, she's, she, um, I was a stay at home dad for a year. <laughs> I mean, like, that's like kind of an embarrassing, you know, like no dad wants to, you know, um, she paid our bills for a year while I was in my basement, like podcasting, you know, like that, like that is an incredible, um, amount of love, um, you know, and, and uncertainty she was willing to, you know, women want security and certainty. And, and she was willing to put herself in that position where so much was uncertain because she loved me that much. I, I think it's just, uh, she's, she's really an amazing woman. So that's why when she, you know, when she asks for a chicken coop, I build her a chicken coop. And when she <laughs> yeah. wants a new floor, she, she gets the new floor. <laughs> and whatever she wants, she gets. <laughs> well, I guess we need to thank her for uh, kind of believing in you and, and uh, being willing to take all that on because, uh, you know, we've probably gotten a lot of really great articles of humor and, and funny headlines <laughs> thanks to uh, her efforts, right? So that's right. It's uh, all no, her, I really, Kelsey. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Kelsey. Um, yeah, that's just so beautiful, man. I love, uh, it's just so amazing to see examples like that. And that for some reason, isn't really brought to light enough. You know, we, we talk about all these negative things in our life. So just thanks for mm. starting us off with such a, a beautiful, um, example of what a strong, loving marriage should look like. Um, well, you know, I just, before you move on from that, I, yeah, I think it's important to, to understand that, um, a, a good woman can make a man great and vice versa. A good man can make a, a woman, a good woman. Like, um, you know, I think that a lot of times when we're married, we're married young, we're, we're kind of like this raw material and uh, really rough around the edges. Um, and our spouses ha and the love that we share have this way of, of lifting us up to something better than we normally would be. And that's, that's why I'm such a proponent of marriage is it really, um, it turns average men into great men, a good marriage. Yes. Can. Agree completely. Um, you know, you, you respond to each other, right? And if you, if you allow the grace to exist, like you're saying to kind of smoothen out those rough edges, um, yeah, we, we make each other better. And, uh, yep. so couldn't agree more. I, lo I love that you, brought that up um can you can you tell us how many kids you got and a little bit more just kind of about your background before we move on to some of the crazy pop culture topics that we've got teed up yeah totally so um i was uh a homeschool kid i was the oldest of six um i uh let's see um i joined the military when i was uh, 19 was deployed overseas um uh my wife and I got married in 2010 and, um, we have five kids. Um, we have two twin boys, uh, that are 11. We have an eight year old girl, a, a, a six year old girl and a 15 month old boy. And, um, uh, yeah. Um, and my wife would have like 50 kids if I let her, I'm, I'm like trying to, I'm trying to hold her back here, but you know, <laughs> it, you, you kind of have that question. It's like, you know, what's the right number you want to, it's good to have lots of kids, but you also want to do right by the kids that you have and make sure that you, you can yeah. do a good job with them. So it's kind of like, what's that magic number? I don't know. Well, you're a Marine, you got a whole fire team. Now you're halfway to a squad. So there you go. <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, uh, you know, I can't really relate. I have one. So, um, <laughs> I think Justin and Brandon are the only one here with a, with a set. So like, all of us combined have as many kids as you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, if you're, if you're concerned about having more, I always say that, uh, two to three is max difficulty. Everything after three, it's, it's like gravy, like whatever. It's another one. Who cares? You're a pro by then your nerves, like nothing bothers you or phases you anymore. You realize you don't need much. You can put a baby on the floor and they're fine. You can put food on the floor and they're fine. And <laughs> things yeah. get a lot easier. <laughs> what, is it, what is it? The comedian said, he says, imagine you're drown is Jim Gaffigan. He said, imagine you're <laughs> drowning, holding three children and somebody hands you a baby. And that's basically the fourth kid. So 
<laughs> no, nope. that's so true. That's so true. All right. Well, Joel, thanks for kind of sharing your your backstory a little bit, and uh, I think we'd like to kind of get into some some juicy topics. Uh, Dustin, you want to take away probably the most current event right now with what yeah, dropped yesterday? Yeah. So we have to talk about uh, Elon. So for anyone who missed it, um, last night he was uh, being interviewed um, and was asked by Andrew Ross Sorkin. Um, you know, what are you going to do about these advertisers? Um, you're clearly making terrible mistakes by alienating them. You know, you're, you're running this company to the ground, you're a mess, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, Joel, maybe you'd like to, uh, say exactly how he responded to that particular interview question. <laughs> I don't, can you cuss on here? I don't know. <laughs> I, I can edit it out. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> no, <I> believe you. <laughs> yeah. He, he told the advertisers to go F themselves, which was a, yep. an amazing moment. That was a, that was wild. I mean, I, I, and it was so funny because there was complete silence in the in the room, <laughs> and so he repeated it. <laughs> like maybe you guys didn't hear me the first time. I'm gonna say it again. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it is refreshing uh, and really weird to see somebody with that much um, r- that much resources, that much power and wealth. Um, not speaking like with the corporate drivel or the politically correct, like, you know, uh, meaningless, uh, corporate speak, whatever. Um, it is. So I, I'll tell you a little bit. I mean, cause you know, the, the B and the, and Elon have a little bit of a relationship. Um, yeah. Can I interrupt he- and thank you all for, uh, you know, making X what it is now because, because of your guys' uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, getting banned. Uh, you put the, yeah. the chain reaction in motion to get us to where we are today. So we'd like to officially yeah. thank the Babylon Bee on behalf of the Present Fathers podcast oh, for yes. fixing yeah, you're, you're welcome. No, <laughs> that was my stupid joke. So th- it was. I actually, oh, it was. Oh, that, yeah. You got a bed. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. Yeah. So, so this you was, you were the one who tipped it too far. That's amazing. Yeah, I um, because and the only reason it got published because my editor in chief was out that day. And, uh, normally he like, he, he's my like person who shoots down my stuff. Um, he was out that day and he had messaged me that morning. He's like, Hey, our traffic has kind of sucked the last three weeks. So let's like, let's figure out something to get the traffic up. So I was like, all right. And, um, Rachel Levine, this transgender uh, HHS secretary had been named USA today's woman of the year, biological man. And, um, so we, you know, like sometimes the B hands out awards, like every year we make Donald Trump our Christian of the year, <laughs> which is ridiculous, you know? Um, and so, um, we were like, let's, let's name Rachel Levine, our man of the year. So we, we made this fake award and, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> there it is. And, uh, so I just kind of, I just kind of typed it up really quick and I threw it out and, um, Kyle, my editor in chief, he he texted me when he saw it go up on the website, and he's like, "Dude, I think you're going to get us kicked off of Twitter." <laughs> and uh, and uh, so yeah, sure enough, I think like the next day, the day after that, we were kicked off of Twitter. And um, at the time, Elon Musk was in uh, Frankfurt, Germany, opening a new Tesla factory, and he's kind of a B fan, and he's interacted with our content before. And I think he came. Well, he came back. You guys to the interviewed States. him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've interviewed interviewed him a couple times, um, which is which is wild in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, Crazy. Yeah. And um, so he came back to the states, and I think uh, he must have, you know, looked at his phone. Like, okay, after that long trip, he sat down on his couch. He looked at his phone, looked at the Babylon Bee's feed, and there was no new content for the last couple of weeks up on our 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 Twitter profile. And he um, he DM'd. Uh, he DM'd us and said, Hey, can I call you guys? And, uh, so I was, this was my birthday. Um, I went on a date with my wife for my birthday and we had had a nice, a really nice dinner. And I had like a few beers and a few glasses of wine. I was feeling really relaxed and happy. And, and, uh, we were driving home and Kyle Mann calls me and says, dude, Elon Musk is about to call me. And I have to go on Fox News in 10 minutes. Can you go on Fox News for me? And so I can talk to Elon Musk. And I'm like, I'm like a little bit, you know, I, I'm a few beers in. I'm like, <laughs> like, what do you want me to talk to Laura just, just or send Ingram or whoever about? <laughs> Full set. You know, 
And so I, I didn't even have this office at the time. So I was doing all my work in my laundry room. So I had to put like a sheet up behind me and like set up in my laundry room. I talked to Laura Ingram on Fox and then Kyle talked to Elon and, and Elon, I apparently kind of the way Kyle relays this to me is Elon said, you know, like, so what's going on? What happened? Why are you kicked off Twitter? And, uh, Elon and Kyle told Elon what the joke was that got us kicked off. And Elon kind of did his funny Elon laugh that he does, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then according to Kyle, Elon just went on this rant for like an hour about how sick he was of all this wokeness that's just ruining everything. And he started talking about all, all these shows that he used to love that went woke and now they're terrible. And, um, and how annoying and frustrating it was. And now they, now the woke people have ruined Twitter and this is terrible. And then there was, there was kind of a pause and a silence on the line. And, and Elon said, maybe I should just buy Twitter. And, um, the next day, uh, Elon put a, a, a poll out on his Twitter that said, do you think Twitter abides by the principles of free speech? Yes or no. And, be careful about how you answer this because this will have real world consequences or whatever it was he said. And, you know, the rest is history. So, um, uh, it's, it is, it is wild, um, that, you know, God took, a a couple of like former corporate sales guys that like to make stupid jokes on the internet and used it to influence this very wealthy man to buy one of the most powerful social networks in the world. And now, I mean, we're seeing hearings in Congress now exposing all of yeah. the stuff that the government like was the Twitter doing files and stuff. That's the insane. Twitter files, how they were, they were colluding with all these government funded yeah. groups to censor people and all this stuff that's been exposed, you know, because of the stupid Rachel Levine joke. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, God works in mysterious ways. It's, it's, um, it's, it's you, uh, you need to put that on your resume. You gotta like try and, try and condense all that to a single yeah. bullet now. You know? Just just put the bullet doing the Lord's work. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It ain't much, but it's so honest we, work. We kind of derailed you, but I think in the broader context of like where it is now, Elon said that last night to uh, you know in, in front of this big audience about you know well f them. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think it, we're at the point like where the pendulum's starting to swing back now, or do you think it's still kind of out there and this is just like everyone's still trained blows because to your point mm-hmm. about pop culture, politics, schools, like e- every, every aspect of modern life seems to be completely permeated by the woke, you know, ideology. And you have to watch what you say and you have to watch what you post on whatever, because you'll get fired yeah. from your job and all this kind of stuff. And like, I personally know people who run businesses and they're, they like, they they can't even endorse people that they like, <laughs> on social media with from their business point of view because they're afraid that it they'll literally get shut down like they'll pull their yeah. shopify or whatever right and like that's insane that we live in a yeah. world like that so do you think elon saying that last night is actually kind of like hey it's coming <laughs> back or or do you think we still got a long way to go because i know you guys like live and breathe yeah. this stuff way more than i probably do so. yeah that's tough man i you know We've had some victories, you know, obviously there's Twitter, um, you know, BlackRock kind of backed off on the ESG stuff, which I don't necessarily buy. They're probably just going to rebrand it and re-release it as something else. Um, you know, we've, we've seen some comedians here and there that have pushed back against some of this, you know, Bill Maher, Dave Chappelle, um, some of these guys that have, uh, been outspoken. Yeah, um, right. yeah, you know, and that's, that's been encouraging. I, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm and I'm kind of a pessimistic guy and not in a, not in a dour or sad way. I I'm kind of a, a glass half empty guy, uh, in the sense that I, I tend to just kind of assume that the worst thing that can possibly happen will happen. And I think that's probably what makes me a good satire writer because that's what, you know, uh, that's, that's what we do at the B is just predict the next stupid thing that will happen. Um, I, uh, sometimes I, I, I feel like, you know, some of these small victories are really just that small victories, but the overall trajectory is that it's still going down and that it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Um, I, I still kind of think that, and I, I, you know, 
and I think that's okay. You know, if it if it turns out better, then I'll be pleasantly surprised. But um, I think my focus is that is, you know, that can feel helpless sometimes. I think you know we we see the kind of the republic crumbling around us, and we see the the way the world is, and the, and the the culture just kind of disintegrating can feel feel very helpless. Um, in those times, it's it's really good to kind of focus in on, okay, I've been given this small little slice of earth, my kingdom in Ohio with my family, my wife and my kids, um, and to, to watch over them. Um, my responsibility is to my kids to make sure that I'm raising um, men and women of character and courage who are going to be able to stand up in whatever culture they grow up in. Um, uh, you know, and, and that's all I can do. You know, I don't know how it'll end up, but, um, you know, there are some encouraging signs, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to be completely hopeless. Sure. Um, but, um, but, uh, it, it could be turning around, but I, my, my overall instinct tells me that it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Well, I, I personally think you hit the nail on the head with, people being critical thinkers and being raised to stand up for things. And so we're seeing that with people like Elon and Jordan Peterson, like Jordan Peterson with his whole ordeal about having to go through that, tr that crazy training by the, the board of psychology in Canada, you know, yeah. but he's, he's basically giving them the middle finger because he's put himself in a position where even if he loses that, he still has his credibility. He still has uh, the, the prominent power and the, the ability to speak freely and, and he has that platform in which he can project that. And and one of the things that he's doing now, too, is he's preventing the woke factory, as I call it, which is basically any Ivy League or major major college at this point, because uh, they're very far left leaning. And and unfortunately, it's it's one of those things where, you know, these kids are I think the statistic I read yesterday was 70 percent of kids who are going that are Christian uh, faith belief. Uh, systems are losing their faith and denouncing their faith by the time they get out of college. And so yeah. there's something to be said about that. And, and Jordan Peterson's putting out his, um, you know, his Peterson Academy or his university, basically, where people are going to start being able to get uh, degree like um, accommodations and they can go get jobs instead of having to go get the piece of paper from mm -hmm. a woke college. Right. And so that's mm -hmm. that's something important that I think is a vital step in us taking it in the right direction. I, I agree. And I was I was I was kind of I had a tweet in my mind. I haven't figured out exactly how to word it, but I, I was thinking about that today. And that like the first major corporation that figures out they're much better off not hiring any college graduates is the winner. Like like I mean, you hire a college graduate, you're hiring someone who's not only deeply in debt but also probably dumber than they went in four years ago. Um, you know, you hire someone younger. You, that gives you more time to to teach them the skills that you need them to know to do their job. I I personally all the skills that I I needed in the corporate world, I learned none of those in college. I learned all those in the job. So, you know, college is a racket and I I, I think people are waking up to that. I think that by the time my boys come of age, I, my hope is that it'll be common knowledge that college is kind of a waste of time and money and and my boys won't really need it and they won't need it to find jobs. So, um, yeah. I think j just that alone kind of, um, sidestepping that, that huge kind of woke factory, as you put it, that's, that's a good term, um, <laughs> will be a huge victory, you know, cause it really yeah. is. It's it, all of this is artificial, like the wokeness, the, 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 this whole right. philosophy, um, it is, it's top down enforced. No one really actually thinks this way. It's, it's forced on people. And, um, and so, yeah, you, you, uh, you, you fight back against that power and, and it, it crumbles pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and AI, I think yeah. is one of the things that's surplanting it as well. Right. I mean, AI is, <laughs> yeah. is such a, a knowledge base for us at, at the f fingertips. Right. So it's like, you know, little Johnny's in school learning math and it's like, well, you're going to use this when you get older. It's like, well, no, I'm not. Everything's going to be automated. <laughs> right. So, you know, either way. Yeah, well, well I, mean, I think there's going to be more of a need for blue collar guys. I mean, AI is going to replace yeah. all the white collar guys yep. and you're going to need people to pump sewers and make HVAC systems, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I think uh, to go back to what you guys were talking about, I think Elon said it best, let the chips fall as they may. And he's not stupid. I mean, he is literally a genius. He's probably one of the smartest men in alive. And uh, I have to say, he pulled a a playbook out of Trump's book, and he got controversial. And I can guarantee you, he's not going to have all these woke advertisement companies helping him. But he is going to have all the ones who are patriots or the ones who are wanting to fight against this. And I'll tell you what, you know, if we don't win the so-called battle now, we're going to win it in the next generation because mm. fathers like us are starting to step up. We're starting mm. to change things and, and make our kids critical thinkers, make them challenge the status quo, make them, you know, learn that, you know, you don't have to follow like a sheep. You need to be a lion. Yep. And, and that's really getting prevalent. We're starting to see that a lot more. And it's opened up my eyes, you know, with this podcast, mm. us seeing those things. So uh, it's. I, I, like you, am a little pessimistic about where we are right now, but I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, we can turn this ship around and, and be the captain. So that being said, though, it, oh, go ahead, Joel. Sorry. No, I, I mean, it really does. The thing, the cool thing about last night with Elon was it really, sometimes it really just, just does take one guy, like one guy saying F you, um, is so inspiring. I mean, I, I don't even think we realize how that one moment last night is going to affect millions of people who see that um, and give them the courage, like, oh, maybe I can say F you too, you know, to, to the people who are mm-hmm. trying to take my integrity um, and, and crush my soul and, and, and force me to lie about what I believe. Um, so yeah, one man turns into a, a couple more and that turns into a thousand, so. It's huge. But at the same time, Elon does want X to be the marketplace of ideas. He doesn't want it to just be right-leaning people. There's no point to that, right? right? The whole idea is that you still have to have people on the left that are interested in engaging. And so that's kind of the challenge is the left has gone so far left while the right hasn't seemed to have moved that far right. And so the center, I think, as he says, you know, feels to the right, mostly because the left went so far left. And so, you know, how do you get a large percentage of people, 40, 50% of Americans who, who think this way, you know, to continue to engage and continue to um, mm-hmm. have this open marketplace of ideas and be able to take a joke. I mean, that yeah. to me is the mark <laughs> of a friend that I can hang out with. If I can't yeah. joke with you, Dustin, that's offensive. Don't say that. It's, <laughs> it's so hard to be friends with someone like that. I, I don't want to walk yeah. in eggshells with my buddy, you know, we're out yeah. playing some tennis together or something. And you're telling me that, you know, I'm offending you. The moment someone's offended, it's hard to keep friendships alive. It's hard to go that direction. So, you know, my yeah. hope is that we can find a way to have people on both sides talking together without getting offended, right? That's the Overton window, right? Is the, um, mm-hmm. everything that you can talk about within a certain window that nobody gets offended. And I don't know how you do that on social media. That seems to be the big issue is everyone gets offended so easily on social media. Whereas, it, you know, if we're hanging out together, um, you know, with our chickens, we're much less likely to get offended because we're talking together. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you have any opinion on that, Joel. Yeah. No, well, I, I think that a lot more of that in-person interaction needs to happen. And I think it does need to start with men getting together with other men. And I, don't, I know that's hard for <laughs> us, <laughs> you know, like uh, I'm, I can speak for myself, you know, I'm, I'm happy just being a hermit um, you know, and it's, it takes some effort to, you know, interact and, and be social and, and be, make friends, you know? And so, but I think it's important. I think, I think we need to start seeing more men, more dads, um, getting together, whether it's, you know, reading good books together, just smoking a cigar, um, strengthening, each, strengthening and sharpening each other. Um, uh, that, that more of that needs to take place. I think the social media can be a catalyst for that. I think you can build new networks. You can meet new people, um, that way, but ideally that turns into more in-person interaction. Yeah. Elbow, at, elbow to elbow, you know, knee to knee type of thing. Um, yeah. can we, can we dive in a little bit more on humor and satire and one, let's talk first, like from a cultural perspective, why it's important, but then I'd also like to dive into why as fathers we need to embrace humor and comedy in the home and with our friends. So maybe we'll tackle the big cultural one first and then bring it back to the home. Like what's, yeah, what's good. your, you know, how would you define the importance of it in, in culture? Yeah. Um, 
Well, it, it performs a, a few different functions in, in my view. Um, what the B does is, I mean, it's not pure comedy. There's satire and the, those two things aren't exactly the same. It, there is some overlap. So, you know, the function of comedy, um, you know, it is, it's, it's relief. Um, it's, it's laughter. Um, Dustin, kind of like you said, I think it is, it helps you build relationships with people. I, I, I think one of the reasons race relations have gone so far south in this country is we can't joke w with each other anymore. You know, like, I, you know, what, if any of you guys who are in the military, you know, is it like you, you tell racist jokes all the time and that's, that's how you build camaraderie with, with people of different races. Um, you know, so, so it kind of has that, that social cohesion, uh, function. Um, the other function of what we do is, is mocking bad ideas. So it's kind of a, it has like an antibody effect uh, to bad ideas and, and hopefully preventing them from taking root in the culture, you know? So um, the reason, for example, gender ideology has gone as far as it has um, is it hasn't been mocked enough um, because it really is very silly um, and it doesn't deserve respect. And, um, and so, you know, um, part of what we do is, is kind of like mocking those sacred cows, um, that you're not supposed to make fun of, um, encouraging people, you know, in the fact that they aren't so scary, you know, you can make fun of them too. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I think it's a very important thing. And, and, and when our, when our elites and, and the people in our news people, the people who are supposed to be telling us the truth, when all those people have failed us, it, it usually kind of ends up falling on the comedians because the comedians are the ones who are really immature and they don't have much respect <laughs> and they, and they're willing to say things that just piss people off. Like, you know, they're the immature kid in the corner saying, you know, the emperor doesn't have any clothes, you know? Um, and so you don't want it to remain that way. I mean, the goal of that is to hopefully steer society back to this place where, you know, you do have elites and intellectuals who are telling the truth and it's not just the comedians anymore. Um, but that's, that's part of the function of it, I think. Yeah. I remember, I guess it was like two or three years ago now, but I was like listening, you know, occasionally I was seeing stuff from Russell Brand and I was like, <laughs> am I, am I hearing this right? Like the, that, that Russell Brand and he's saying <laughs> this and like, I'm agreeing with it. Like the world has completely, <laughs> you know, I was yeah. like, the fact that he's making more sense you know, is this just weird kind of goofy comedian guy from England, you know, and what are the more... odds a hundred allegations came out of the woodwork? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, no, no chance. I don't agree with him probably of... on almost yeah. everything, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, he's at well, least like letting both sides speak, you know? And I was like, yeah. wow, that's insane that, you know, well, and that's him what's been so weird about the this sane yeah. public figures now, because in order to be funny, in order to tell a good joke, you have to be telling the truth. And, so there's been this weird thing that's happened with like weird with far left comedians and even right wing comedians. The ones that are committed to telling a good joke and telling the truth have kind of like merged and kind of met in the middle a little bit. So you have Russell Brand and Bill Maher and these other guys who who um, are telling are telling the truth because that's what's funny. That's where the funny is. And uh, so I there's this. Um, there is laughter is kind of an involuntary acknowledgement of the truth. When you're laughing at a joke, um, you're acknowledging a truth and it kind of breaks through those ideological barriers. So that's kind of been fun to see. Uh, Russell Brand is a hoot, man. I, I remember watching him on like, you know, old interviews with Conan and like forgetting Sarah Marshall and all the, you know, those movies, just this wild, crazy guy. And now he's like, uh, you know, he's like Alex Jones now. It's just wild. Well, I mean, let's just be real. These uh, these woke clowns, they're softer than the other side of the pillow. And uh, I love, <laughs> love to trigger them. And my wife keeps me in check and so do these guys. Because I'm the most controversial one here. I really do not give them that. And uh, actually, I told a person the other day and got banned for two days on Instagram. Um, he said something something woke. And I was like, dude, it's a joke, not a dick. Don't take it so hard. <laughs> so, he didn't fantastic. like that too much. <laughs> That's what our wives are for to keep us in check. My, my wife is, uh, uh, my Twitter feed would be a lot worse if it weren't for my wife, I think. 
Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, with that, let's maybe transition away from the culture aspect and let's bring it back to uh, to humor in the home as a, the role as a father. I think, like you know, my my natural reaction, just kind of anecdotally, is you know, I'm very intense, very like you know, discipline and all that kind of stuff, and you got to take yourself lightly, you know. Yeah. Most of the time, it's better just be chill, you know. So, like, what what is you know the role of humor in the home, according to Joel Berry? Mm. Well, you said it very well. Taking yourself lightly um, is very important. Um, th- and that's another thing that my wife kind of taught me is she's, she's very, she has a very self-deprecating sense of humor. Um, and when we're in a fight, um, she can, she can, um, diffuse the the frustration by by making fun of herself and so i i kind of learned that skill too when we're you know when we're fighting i can diffuse the frustration by making fun of myself i can do the same thing with my kids um your kids will destroy your pride quickly you know i i mean i i was a marine i you know i was used to having a a squad of marines that would do what i said and there was order and there was structure to everything and then you suddenly you have kids and I, i don't know about you guys but having kids is a million times harder than anything I ever did in the, <laughs> in the military. And it yeah. really humbles you and you realize how selfish you are and how imperfect you are. And, uh, so, um, you know, yeah, what the essence of comedy is, is, I mean, in order f- for you to have credibility before an audience, um, you have to start by making fun of yourself. And if you see stand up comedians, they usually start by talking about how fat they are or how ugly they are or whatever. And it kind of, you, you kind of build that credibility to be able to start roasting the audience and roasting other people a little bit. And so it, very important as a parent and as a husband uh, to, to not take yourself so seriously. Um, that'll, that'll help a marriage uh, last a lot longer for sure. Now. Okay. So with your kids cutting your pride down and having funny, <laughs> funny experiences and just being witty at, at certain times, you know, that stroke of genius, has there ever been, like a situation in your family where you've you've gotten hit by your kids with something and it's so good that you used it towards like something satirical on on the site on Babylon B. <laughs> yeah, I think I probably have. I um a lot of the the jokes about kids or about wives are just me and the other writers just ranting about stuff, just complaining about it. <laughs> stuff that happened that day. Um so yeah, it does happen. And my wife my wife will usually sometimes she'll read something and she'll be like that. That was you from yesterday. Wasn't it? You know? So, um, Joel, did you write names. the joke that was like, um, wife wants the perfect gift, but won't tell you what it is. And is like mad that she didn't get the, <laughs> cause I said that to my wife and she was like, that's not true. And I was like, it totally is. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was like a wife, um, uh, wife has perfect gift in mind that she wants for Christmas, but she wants husband to think of it himself. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. I love that. Um, that was, George stuck on me. I was going to ask kind of like, can you talk to us a little bit about the process, Joel? Like, yeah. you know, you're remote. Most of the teams yeah. over in California, like how do you guys, you know, get things together and, and stuff to, uh, to really pick, out of all the craziness going on, how do you kind yeah. of stay ahead of it? Mm. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm in Ohio. Uh, the, a lot of the creative team is out in California. So like our YouTube channel, some of the, the sketches that we do, that's all in California. Um, and then we have, uh, part-time writers like all over the country. And, um, you know, most of them just kind of do this on the side for fun. Um, like we have surgeons and engineers, like, fast food workers, like it runs the gamut of all different walks of life. Um, you know, it was up until like a few months ago, it was all men too. (laughs) We didn't have any women, you know, and we were convinced, you know, we will never have a, women aren't funny. We don't have any, we recently hired a woman writer that's actually pretty funny. So I stand corrected, but, um, uh, so what I'll, I'll typically do is, um, someone's going to get offended by that. (laughs) <laughs> I was just to say we I just hope. got demonetized. All our <laughs> all our wives, yeah. Um so I'll usually get up um I'm on East Coast time so you know I'm kind of waking up with the news cycle. Um I'm look 
the first thing I'm doing is uh, pulling up like every news site, left leaning news sites, right leaning news sites and everything in between. Um, and I'm kind of trying to get, I'm, I'm kind of doing what Drud, Matt Drudge does, like kind of trying to get a vision for what the big conversations are that day. What are some of the big points that need to be made? Um, what's, what's going to go viral? What's going to do well? Um, and so I'm kind of, I'm compiling a list early in the morning. Um, and then I'm kind of, after that, I send out the marching orders to our team and then we just start pitching. So we have a common Slack channel that we use and, um, it's just a pitch storm all day. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, terrible, terrible jokes. And, and we just keep pitching terrible jokes until we get a good one. I mean, we're not, none of us are like professionally trained comedians. That's, I think that's part of the charm of the bee. Like we're not. Harvard guys that wrote for the Harvard Lampoon or SNL or anything like we're just kind of all normal family men that yeah. have normal jobs. Um, and I think that kind of gives a flavor to our our humor that is um, like something people recognize and, and is a little more endearing. Um, and uh, so so, yeah, you know, uh, you have to have thick skin um, because there's a lot of rejection you know, I will shoot your joke down. My jokes get shot down all the time. Sometimes jokes that I'm really attached to get shot down and I pout about it for a little while. Um, but that's just comedy. I mean, you, 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 you have to be willing to kill your darlings, as they say. And, um, and uh, so the more pitches, the better. Uh, the more pitches you, you have out there, the more likely you are to stumble onto some gold. And so those you know, those seven, eight jokes per day that you see on our website, that's the result of hundreds of pitches that have been sent out. Wow. So, yeah. So, so yeah, you guys really aren't good at humor. <laughs> no, no, it's just a numbers game. That's it. <laughs> well, uh, I wanted to share one more thing because it just really highlights how insane things are and how you guys actually do get beaten to the punch sometimes by uh, the reality uh, versus the, the sarcasm. So you guys are going to write this it says, in strong response to rising hate crimes against Jews, Democrats denounce Islamophobia. And like right before you guys were going to post it, Kareem Jump here said, Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim have endured a disproportionate number of hate field attacks. <laughs> <laughs> so are you guys yeah. actually prophets or are you just, you know, really good at guessing? Yeah, we're just pessimists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's... Um, it really is. Uh, it's just as simple as, you know, kind of thinking like a liberal and what's 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 the logical kind of trajectory that we're on. I mean, progressivism is very um, easy to to predict because it really is just kind of on a it's on a railroad to off the edge of the cliff and you can kind of see where it's going next. Um, yeah, it's like uh, so. show me on the doll, Timmy, where uh, you got offended today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think we have close to like a hundred headlines now that have come true in one, one way or another. We keep track of them on the site. We have a, that we call them prophecies, but it's really just, I mean, we have like, you know, 12,000 articles or something like that at this point. So it's, I mean, a hundred prophecies out of 12,000 isn't, isn't really that great of a record, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, I've always been a big fan. And I think to your point about kind of just being, you know, it's just like real people doing it and it's not this big organization or whatever that, you're, you know, classically trained in it or something. I, you yeah. know, I've always been a huge fan just from that point of view. That's what resonated with me. It was like, Hey, this is, it's just genuinely funny. You know, they kind of poke at everyone. It's not purely just left leaning. Like you make fun of the church stuff and everything. And those are actually usually some of my favorite ones, like stuff about youth pastors and yeah, you know, there's a whole there's a whole you guys have had a, re- a lot of really good ones there because there's a lot of funny things about church. But we, um, we try to keep yeah. keep that as a core part of our brand. Like those articles don't do as well anymore because like, we're kind of known as these political satire guys. But we we try to at least get one like good Christian or church joke in there a day if we can, because uh, that's 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 important to to what we do, I think. I always enjoy the running joke, uh, go to church or heathen. I can always <laughs> look forward to that one coming out every week. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. That's right. For sure. So, Joel, you wrote a book on it. Um, can you give us a definition of what wokeism is? What, uh, what is it? What isn't it? Um, you know, what, what's like a quick, pithy, like, you know, uh, elevator speech of what it is? 
Uh, oh my gosh. I don't even know. Um, it's been so long since I re- wrote that book now. Can we just I, say um, mental illness? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's kind of, I mean, uh, the, there's so many ways you can define it. I've defined it as, uh, you know, um, you know, during the kind of the BLM riots, I kind of defined it as like uh, the left's way of, of leveraging America's hatred of racism into a hatred of capitalism. Um, there's a, a sense to where it's kind of a a replacement religion for a country that's um, that has turned its back on God. Um, so I think there's, there's a sense to where, you know, in the 20th century, we had modernism and Darwinism and, and we saw where that led with Nazism and communism and did some horrible things in the 20th century. And I think that wokeism is kind of like this way to, in their mind to kind of correct maybe some of the things the sins of, of the 20th century without having to accept God. Like we can't do that, you know? Um, and so it ends up having pitfalls of its own. It ends up kind of being a, a replacement, very legalistic uh, and uh, nasty religion, um, a way for people to feel virtuous, feel righteous and good about themselves without actually having to be righteous and good. Um, it's like a religion with no spirituality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a materialistic religion. Um, you know, and it's Marxism. I mean, it's just the, it's the, the, the modern version of Marxism, materialism, um, reducing all uh, human meaning to a struggle for power, which is really just nasty and animalistic. It's a terrible thing. It's, it's horrible, but it's also really funny and it makes people do really funny things, which is great for us because we get to tell a lot of jokes. So, uh, it, you it's know, like Fedora's I, the, box, at least you get the hope in the bottom. Yeah. Something. Well, I mean, the, the, the funny thing about the book too, is that like, we didn't have to exaggerate wokeness that much for it to be funny. It was a, a lot of it is just a straight retelling of what wokeness is. And that alone reads like comedy. So, um, it makes our job a, a little easy. Interesting. Okay. Having issues with the mute button tonight. <laughs> I was, uh, I was going to ask in that vein though. So like, what's, what's kind of the antidote then, right? Obviously, for those of us who are believers, we believe that. But for maybe for people who are either on the fence or just are tired of wokeness, but they're not a Christian or don't want to entertain that, like what's what's at least something yeah. men listening can do in their own homes, in their own little communities to uh, kind of put a stop to that. And that for my mm-hmm. my thought is maybe it's kind of taking stands like Elon did a little bit. We got to have some bold, um, you know, pushback in areas of things where if you don't think it's right, you got to stand up for it. But there's a risk to that mm-hmm. um, for people. So what what do you think in that regard? Yeah. Well, you know, obviously, l- like you said, I'm biased. I, you know, I think God is the answer to all of this. But um, regardless of where you stand on that and on religion, um, I think that um, deep down, um, a lot of us know what is right and wrong. Um, we have these moral consciences, um, whether you want to call it common sense or whatever, um, you know, I think, um, there, there are some very fundamental truths that are undeniable, um, that we just know innately, you know, and based on observation of the world. And, um, I think one of the most important things about being a man is um, having the strength and the integrity um, to always tell the truth, Um, no matter how much it hurts you, whether it hurts your career, um, whether it makes your life harder. um, It is very important to tell the truth um, and to not let yourself um, be defined, um, by others. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up, you know, in the nineties, I, I remember the first time I saw Braveheart and how inspiring that was. <laughs> and like the, this, the idea that, you know, a man can be defeated in battle, captured in prison, drawn and quartered and then disemboweled. And somehow still he ends up the winner because he has never sacrificed his integrity. Um, I think that's something that, that 
really awaken that idea awakens something in every man, you know, and, you know, if, if enough men have integrity enough to, to do what they know to be right and to, and to speak the truth boldly, um, I think that alone will be enough to, to turn back the tide. When we saw how powerful just one man speaking publicly was, imagine if we all did that um, mm. in our jobs, you know, whether, and that's, that's a gut check too. I mean, I, I'm, I will freely admit that it, this is very easy for me to say, because I'm, I have a job where I'm paid to be provocative and, and make fun of wokeness. You know, there are a lot of men that work in corporate jobs and their families and kids are depending on them. Um, you know, where they have to go to a DEI training and, you know, they're put their pronouns in their email signatures and all these things. And so I'm not going to tell people what they should do. I think that's something that you have to decide for yourself. Um, but you have to ask yourself, how many pieces of your soul are you willing to let these people take from you? Um, you know, and, and what is it, what is it worth to you? What is the money worth to you? So, yeah. So that's that's such a good good subject criteria to go into. You, you speak about people need to learn integrity. <clears throat> what are some some ways that you have? Because you have a broad range of age for your kids. Um, what are some ways that you have integrated integrity into your children? Hmm. Um. <sighs> that's tough. I I mean. <laughs> That's the other thing, you know, I, going back to how kids humble you, you know, I can s sit here in a podcast and talk a big game about integrity and, and courage and things like that. And then, you know, when you're dealing with kids and they're, um, they're lying to you or, um, you're doing something that they're doing something, you know, is wrong. Um, you know, that, that, that can be really tough. Um, I think, um, it, it, as far as raising my kids go, and I'm, I'm thinking in particular about my boys cause they're 11 years old. They're about that time when they, that starts to become really important. Um, I have started to notice that, um, all the things that I've been telling them since they were little, little kids, cause I love to impart wisdom and I love to talk a lot and I probably talk way too much. <laughs> all of that is like crap, like didn't do anything because they only see what I do and they see how I behave and they see how I treat their mother and they, and they see every time I say I'm going to do something and then I don't do it or I say I'm not going to do something and then I do it. They notice it every single time. <laughs> um, and, um, it is amazing. A child's ability, a child, my kid can't remember to bring his homework to school or, or, his backpack or his coat, but he will remember a promise I made, you know, five years ago, just in passing when I wasn't even really thinking. And so, um, it, it really does test you, um, and, and all the things that you claim to believe, are you really living that out? You know, your, your kids will be the, the, the real litmus test for, for whether you're living that out. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my, my thing would sit my, what I would say is that to, to make sure that your kids uh, have integrity, you need to make sure that you're living that as much as you possibly can. And, the, and when you fail to repent and confess to them, I, that's also important too. I, there's, there's been many times when I've failed and I, I have to own up to that to my kids and, and tell them that I, I messed up and I'm sorry. You know, don't be prideful and don't pretend like you're perfect because they, they know you're not perfect. So you might as well not act like you are. You know, seems like every good dad that I know knows how to apologize. And the dads that really struggle, they're too prideful. They say, I can't apologize yeah. to my kid because I'm always right. And that's a, oof, that's a tough <laughs> yeah. thing for a relationship. You've uh, got to be able to tell your kids, I messed up. I'm sorry. I'm human. It happens. Yep. Um, oh, so you Joel, you were, you were homeschooled. Um, it sounds like you're not homeschooling your kids. Um, tell us about that. What made you uh, kind of make that decision? And um, do you think one is better for certain kids, mm -hmm. certain families? What made you come to that decision? Um, I would say for most families, I would highly recommend homeschooling. Um, the only reason I'm not homeschooling is because we happen to live right next door to a very good conservative charter school that is almost entirely run and attended by 
uh, former homeschool families. So like, it's like a very good crowd, uh, very good teachers. Um, we're friends with a lot of them. They're in our circles. It's almost, I mean, it's, it's, you could almost consider it a it's homeschool collective co-op. homeschooling. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. very, so we, we actually homeschooled our boys for, um, a couple of years before we found this school, which we're very thankful for. And, it, and if we weren't sending them to this school, we would be homeschooling them because I, I wouldn't trust them in a public school. I wouldn't trust, uh, uh I wouldn't even trust most Christian schools nowadays, um, uh, or private schools or Montessori schools, any of that stuff. No, it's, it's all the, the kind of the, the woke ideology has infiltrated everything. And if you're going to raise kids with sound minds, you, you really have to take control of their education, I think. So no judgment if sim- you guys send your kids to yeah. school or anything. That's just my opinion. I think we all do. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm just I'm curious. I'm curious about it because I I never never did it, ha- haven't done it. So you know, and it's something that I've like learned a lot about recently. I think collectively, all of us here. Um, you know, we had a guy named Matt Baudreau on. I don't know if you know who he is, but mm-hmm. really opened our eyes to kind of like where the education system came from in the first place that we have today. And there's a lot of things to consider. And so you know, it's just it's good to get feedback from other people doing it. Um, yeah. So yeah, well, uh, no offense. I will say that it's just, yeah. I mean, if you'd be surprised, um, how little it takes, like you don't need to be smart or, or yeah. trained to do it. Um, and it really does, um, give you the opportunity for really good bonding with your kids too. I mean, I, yeah, um, I've really enjoyed the times when I've been able to like go through assignments and, and uh, books with my boys. Um, I don't know. There's just something really special about that. So, um, yeah. And, and my wife and I've talked, you know, we've talked about going back to homeschooling too. I, you know, mm. I don't know. We're really enjoying the convenience of school right now. So I don't know, <laughs> but, um, yeah. But we've talked about going back. I mean, it really is a great thing, and it it you can get it done in like three hours a day. That's that's the other thing. You can be done right. with school by twelve o'clock, and then spend yeah. the rest of the day exploring the woods and going on field trips and right. doing all kinds of cool stuff. Deciding so, what yeah. gender your children should be. Yeah, yeah it takes a lot of time to figure that stuff out. Right? <laughs> it does. Yeah, that's what they're doing uh, most of the time at school. Yeah. 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 Fortunately. Um, so, Interesting. I just had a conversation with a friend um, last week. Uh, Florida has now instituted an $8,000 per child um, stipend if you do homeschooling that you can use for pretty much whatever you want as long as I don't know. Well, I don't think other states are doing that. Um, but that was awesome. a really surprising change. I was just having lunch with a coworker and he said, um, yeah, we homeschool both of our kids and we've always just paid, you know, whatever we had to pay for it, but we're getting $16,000 per year to help pay for it now. And that's like that's a really awesome. big change happening this year. So I, I don't know if anyone's doing it outside of Florida, but it's pretty interesting. That's a great idea. I well, guess they're moving to Florida. Been, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've, on, have you heard of like this, this micro school thing, like, uh, there's this micro school model that's been going around where, yep. kinda, you know, you, you get a certain stipend from the state for each kid. And if you can run a, a tiny little school out of your home with like three or four families, that can, that can be a living wage for you. Yep. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, so I, that another, another encouraging sign that, you know, kind of people are wising up to, to mm-hmm. other options that they have, not just in universities, but with their, their kids, at, you know, yeah. Elementary. Yeah, I schools. think there's, there's multiple, um, I hate to use the word, word alternative, but yeah. if, if that mean makes us alternate to what we're getting, then I guess that's not so bad. But I, I know there are a lot of organizations kind of um, helping people kind of found small micro type schools um, all over to provide different options for for families. But yeah, yeah I've just I've, it's something I'm curious about because I've learned a lot about it in the last year. And you know, beforehand, I never really considered that. So it's, it's cool to see it's working. Um, for so many people and, uh, yeah, yeah. well, I if, had if, a, kept, go ahead. If it's something Sorry. you're, you're thinking about it, you know, I encourage you to, you know, to pray about it and really, really strongly consider it. Um, you know, but it is a sacrifice, you know, it really yeah. is. It's not easy. Um, but I, I do think it's worth it if, if it's something you're, you feel led to do. Right. Um, in a, 
I guess maybe slightly different line of questioning, but ha- have you had any concerns or any issues with given what you do? And like you said, it's very provocative. It, it's very, you know, kind of putting it out there. Have you had any yeah. concerns with your family in, in terms of like people coming after them or any of that kind of stuff? Or do you have concerns for them, like your boys as they age up having to deal with kind of the repercussions yeah. of that? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, so far so good on, on my family. I, I kind of, my, my wife tends to keep pretty private and, and, uh, same thing with my, my kids. Um, you know, I think it, it has caused a bit of a strain, you know, cause I have liberal family members. I have, I have sisters who are, are very leftist and they hate what I do. <laughs> they think I'm the worst person in the world. And, and, um, and so that, that can be tough, you know? Um, and, and sometimes I worry like, you know, if the B goes away, like, will I ever be able to find a job <laughs> anywhere else again? You know, um, because of my, I have this huge paper trail online now that there's no running away from, but, um, no, it, it really hasn't been, um, you know, I, I'm not that high profile to where it's been majorly disruptive to my life. I know our, our owner, Seth Dillon has, he's experienced a lot more of that. I think he's kind of a, a much more out there in the public. He, he's on TV a lot. He's had, you know, his family has been threatened and, and he's had to have security and things like that. And, you know, a lot of the daily wire guys will tell you they've, they've had some of that stuff as well. So I, I consider myself pretty fortunate that I, I get to do what I do, but I'm all, I'm all, I like being more low profile. Um, you know, I, not a lot of people know who I am. My face out isn't out there too much, which is good. So. Well, that's good to hear. For you, not not for <laughs> not for Seth and, and for the others, but um, I well, was it is because yeah. thought about that, and you know, one of our roles is to be the protector of our families, and I was just curious on how you know you kind of wrestle with that, or if you do, it sounds like yeah, it's not really too much of an issue. Well, yeah, my I, I try to kind of the one thing I struggle with is is how much to let my kids in to to what I do, because um, I you know, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is just so dark and depressed. Yeah. I mean, like we're talking about the stuff going on with Hamas and we're talking about gender and, you know, drag queens twerking in front of, in front of kids and stuff like that. And my kids will walk into my office like, daddy, what are you doing? And I'm like, don't look at the screen, you know, don't look at what I'm, <laughs> I'm searching on. <laughs> my my Google search history is an absolute disaster. If you see what I'm, what I'm have to do to, for my research every day. Um, so, you know, that, that's something I'm not quite, sh- I haven't co- quite figured out how to do that yet. Um, I think my, but like, no matter how hard you try to protect your kids, they, they pick up on stuff pretty easily. And my, my 11 year old boys are, are already starting to try, you know, kind of tr- starting to get a sense for what I do. My, my daughter, um, I was watching a Disney movie with my daughter the other day. And, um, uh, one of the characters said something about like, following your heart or believe in yourself or something like that. And my daughter, she's eight years old. She, she raises her hand. She's go, she's like, dad, that's woke. And, uh, so she, and I've never talked to her about wokeness. I think she just kind of has, she's observed me and, and some of the things I've written. So, uh, it's, I'm, I'm glad that she's that discerning. So Joel, how do you handle uh, social media with your kids? Do they um, have accounts? Do they see things on YouTube? Like, how do you um, do you restrict everything, or do you try to allow them to see some things? What's your plan? Yeah, I restrict everything. Um, my kids have never had tablets. Um, they don't have phones, and I don't know when I'm going to do phones. I mean, maybe when they're like sixteen or seventeen. Maybe when they're in high school, I'll get them a phone that can only like do phone calls and that's it. Um, but no social media, no TikTok, no anything, um, none of that stuff. And, um, and part of that is, is trying to protect them from what I suffer from, which is like, I, you know, talking about being present fathers here, I really struggle with being present because I'm always like, I mean, I'm on social media a lot. I'm on the internet a lot. I'm always kind of in my own head thinking about ideas, scrolling through my phone. The phone is so easy to just take out and look at. And 
it can just take you right out of the the picture with your kids. I mean, the difference in interactions when you, when your kid walks into the room and you look at them and smile at them and engage with them is so different from when they walk into the room and they just see you on your phone. Like it's, that is, those are two completely different childhoods, you know? And I really, that's something I will freely admit. I really, I still struggle with putting yeah, that, I do too. that dang phone down. And so I, I want to try to protect my kids from it, but also at the same time, I want them to know how to handle it. Um, in a safe place while they're still in the home too. So that, you know, yeah. when, when do you introduce that? I don't know, but they're still all too young. I, I keep it away at this point. So, yeah, I think that's it's a good definitely plan. Hard to put it in its right place though. I mean, just this week, my wife's given me the look a couple of times cause I'm doing stuff for this podcast, right? I'm trying to <laughs> manage our social media stuff. And it's like, she's talking to me and I get distracted. Cause like, Oh, I was trying to press send on it or whatever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like how, how dumb, right? Like, I, yeah leave it. I can do it later, you know? And, yeah. and I have to catch myself all the time with that, but it's, it's designed to be engaging for a reason, yep. you know, that's how yep. they keep you hooked. So it's really, yeah, and it's, it's only going to get worse. I don't know the answer, but it's, it's a real struggle, but I appreciate you being honest about that. Cause, yep. um, I definitely struggle with it too. Yeah. I think it's something all, all dads these days have to contend with. Um, is that, that addiction? I, I think, 10, 15 years from now, we'll see a lot of angsty coming of age movies about kids who grew up in households where their parents were, had their phones in front of their faces. You know, um, I, I grew up with the eighties movies where, you know, the, the dad's reading the newspaper and disengaged right. with the newspaper. Yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll be the phones for us. So, uh, I thought Wally yeah. was that movie already. <laughs> on the ship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That was, that was a kind of a prophetic movie, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, Brandon, bring us back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, you've you've clearly you're kind of a veteran dad in a bunch of different chapters of life for different kids' ages because you've got you know so many in different ages there. What is one piece of advice you would give to a new dad um, that you you kind of hindsight twenty twenty uh, know from your experiences with your kids? Mm. Um, I'm, I'm processing this. I'm thinking about it. Cause I, I know that I, there are a lot of things with my two oldest. I, I made a lot of mistakes with them, um, that I'm not making with my youngest. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to articulate what those, those are. Um, I think one thing um, for new dads um, that has has really helped me um, is I think relaxing a little bit. Um, I think with my with my first two, I was so, I think I was so terrified of being a bad dad and I was so terrified of raising, uh, bad kids that I was very like, you know, very hard on them. Um, very like on them forcefully if they ever did something wrong or disrespected me or, or, or made a mistake. Um, and I think a lot of that was, was born out of my fear of, of, you know, I want to be a good dad and I want to raise good kids, you know, I, and so I was really hard on my first, first two kids. I think, um, the, the best thing that you can do as a dad, um, are those, those kind of those quiet teachable moments with your kids, um, just where you're just spending time with them, having a conversation with them, um, about their day. I, this is, this is weird. I, I actually was helped greatly by watching a, a video of my wife when she was a baby. Um, and her dad, she has a great dad. She has a great relationship with her dad. So I always kind of tried to observe him. Like, what did he do right that, you know, he has these, these great relationships with his kids. 
And I, I was watching this old home video of, of them at the beach and she's like a one, one and a half year old kid. And she's just like fiddling with a rock or fiddling with the sand or something like that. And her dad, um, just kind of got down on his knees. He sat down next to her and he just started playing with the sand with her. Um, and, um, uh, it's meaningless. It's pointless. Like you're not accomplishing anything with the sand, you know, and, and he's not imparting wisdom or, or anything like that. All the things I like to do. He's, he's, he's just have spending those quiet moments, um, with, with his, his child. And, and those, those moments where you're just enjoying being in someone's presence, um, those add up and and those are what give you credibility as your kids grow older to actually speak into their life. Um, Love that. you know, it's not, it's not regulation and like, you know, yeah. structure, building blah, connection. Blah, blah, blah. it's building connection. Yeah. And, um, and I think I, that's something I wish I would have known earlier. Um, you know, relax a little bit and, and really just genuinely enjoy their, your time with them connect yeah. with them um and 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 be yeah, an example to them yeah yeah i don't know if that was a good answer or not i it's i don't know if i was great. ready for it it's it's uh it's a tough yeah, thing to answer sometimes i always try to hit with ph- philosophical hard-hitting yeah. questions so i apologize that wasn't funny joel i'm very disappointed <laughs> yeah. it wasn't funny yeah. at all yeah there's no jokes anywhere in that oh Come my on, man. Was, yeah that, that, one's, that one's not making the cut for the for tomorrow's post <laughs> yeah no that was uh that, that's like that was what I needed to learn too. So I, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there to. Uh, it was Barton, our recent guest, who said we only punish for sin, mm. and that like really was eye opening for me because it's like if your kid's not really being actually like evil or whatever, they're not trying to just destroy something or whatever. Just let it go, man. Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, especially when they're younger, it's their children. That's what they do. They need to yeah. go break some things that don't mean anything. Like it's a piece of paper. They can clean up the yeah. mess, you know, like I've gotten on with my daughter about stuff like that before. And I just look back and I'm like, man, I needed to just chill. And, yeah. you know, I hope that being aware of it now, I still have some time to kind of like undo that intensity earlier on. But it's, yeah. uh, I think it's an extremely relatable thing that I think a lot of new dads struggle with. Yeah. So I mm-hmm. appreciate you being candid about that. And, uh, I think that's a good piece of advice, but well, I was going to say, it's, it's giving, giving an, a, a certain measure of grace, an amount of grace daily to your children and to yourself. And when you're, when you're acting, you're modeling that out, not only are you teaching them to model, to give themselves grace when they mess up, when they're older, but you're also uh, allowing them to give others grace too. And it's like, if we can't model that, they're, they're not going to learn that. Right. And so mm-hmm. that's something, yeah, I think we all, all dads struggle with that, right. Where we want to be that authoritarian, um, you know, uh, you listen to your mom, you listen to me and that's, that's the end of it. Right. And it's like, yeah. no, there's so much more. They might have good intention behind whatever action they did. Right. You know, we had a yeah. guest, uh, Nick Friedis came on and talked about his kids mm. came into a just destroyed kitchen and he, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of raised his voice at him and, and the, the older daughter came and gave him some grace, but said, Hey, look, you know, they were trying to bake you breakfast, you know, oh. like, so the intent, once he understood Oof. the intent, he was able to correct the situation and go apologize. But it's like, it's important for us to know our children's hearts. And like you said, being present and just being in the moment with them helps us learn that. But giving them grace helps us mm-hmm. learn it for ourselves, right? And so it's, a, it's super important. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, something a little happier. Um, so as, <laughs> as fathers, we have uh, memories in time or stories or um, just points in time that we we really like recollect and think about or just enjoy thinking about um is there ones or a story specifically that you can think of um that really kind of resonates with you that you want to share T- uh times with my my kids uh, moments moments with the yeah, kids yeah moments as a father hmm <laughs> Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's a million flooding through right now, but yeah, you know, I mean, um, I, I, I love taking the kids out um, on on dates. I do that, you know, once a week or so. Try to take each one out, in, you know, individually and and spend some time with them. 
I think my, my favorite, my, my kids are such talkers. Um, and I, I love taking them out. And from the moment we leave the house to the time we come back, it's just one long run on sentence, like, like from them, like, and I have half the time, I have no clue what they're talking about. And they're just connecting like completely unrelated things and switching subjects. And, and, um, it just, it just tickles me. I, I, cause they just, they just love to talk to me. And, um, and I just, I, I don't even have to do anything. I just listen and I, I throw in a few comments here and there and, uh, it's just so fun. And, and sometimes you just get gold from these kids, you know, I mean, cause they really, they, they are just so funny. They have such, uh, funny little senses of humor. Um, my, uh, my, my eight year old, um, had been bugging me for a long time. She wanted to watch Iron Man because I had let her older brothers watch Iron Man with me earlier this year. And, uh, so she kept bugging me and bugging me. She really wanted me to let her watch Iron Man. And so she, um, uh, she wrote a letter and she put it in our mailbox, uh, pretending that it was from the government. And the letter said, um, dear Joel Berry, uh, tonight you will let your kids watch Iron Man or you will be killed from government. <laughs> <laughs> she's going places that's good yeah she's she's something else man but um i just you know i i think when you when you realize you know like your kids aren't just like uh they're not just extensions of you they really are like their own universe into themselves they, they really are their own people and um it really is fun to learn about them um, because you think you know everything about them because it's like, oh, they're me, they're my wife, you know, I, 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 but no, they really, right. they have their own original thoughts. They have their things to say that you would never guess and uh, just take them out and let them go and let them, let them blather on. It's, it's just so fun. It's so fun. And bedtime, I think bedtime is something I, I rail on uh, talking to dads. Don't skimp on bedtime because kids, for some reason, tend to open up. And that's always when you're most tired and you just want to get to bed and you want to watch a movie and drink a beer. And that's when kids are asking like the deepest, you know, most hard hitting questions. And so you really have to um, stick it, stick with them in those those bedtime hours. Those can be really precious, too. Sorry if I'm I agree with that, man. No, no. So Uh, actually, that's that's something that Austin and I do every night. He. We'll go to his room, and uh, it's something that my wife kind of instilled in us too. But she's she's big on routines. But my routine with him is every night we go up to his his bedroom, and I, I dim the lights, and he says Bible, Bible, and we go and get our, our uh, Bible, and I'll read him a few like short stories from the Bible, and that's yeah, awesome. it's awesome. So yeah, no, that's <laughs> that, that's that's amazing, man. Oh, I did skimp on bedtime tonight to be on this podcast, but that's the only yeah. exception. That, uh, so we apologize for uh, <laughs> making you be a bad dad uh, tonight. But, uh, oh, the funny. irony. It's, yeah, <laughs> the irony. That, that should be one of your stories. Father uh, you can, doesn't Yeah, you can, you can roast us down the Babylon Bee. Father ignores <laughs> kids. article tomorrow. <laughs> Father abandons family to be on President Father's podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Please make that happen. Ship it, <laughs> ship it to Twitter. Oh man, that's great. Yeah, but on a serious note, I, like I still remember my dad doing bedtime with me, and you know, and like I, he would like get like rub up in between my shoulders or whatever, and I would just like <laughs> rack out immediately from that, and it's just so soothing. And like I remember that vividly still, you know, and, and I'm in my mid thirties, so that's awesome. Yeah, that's great, great advice there to not skimp on on bedtime because that's yeah. that's definitely a, a special moment there. Um, so Joel, thank you for all of your time tonight and uh, sorry to take you away from the kids, but where can people get connected with you? Obviously, BabylonB.com, that kind of speaks for itself, but where else? Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I, I, I know Dustin is a big fan of your short stories, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, BabylonB.com, uh, you can subscribe. Uh, if you subscribe, you can, you know, there's a little more content. You can interact with me and some other writers. Um, Mike, crazy Twitter feed. You're free to follow if that's, that's your thing. Um, if you subscribe, I'm, I'm trying to get more into writing and, and doing short stories. So, um, I, I appreciate the encouragement. I, I'll, I'll probably, tr- I have a few that I'm working on and I should probably finish those and get those out. So if you subscribe to me on Twitter, I think it's like three bucks a month or something like that. You'll get some, you'll get some short stories and some other, you know, 
more personal, you know, you'll, you'll see pictures of my chickens and my kids and stuff like that uh, on my, on my Twitter. So yeah. Perfect. Well, Joel, um, really appreciate it, man. This was uh, a lot of fun for us. A uh, little, little bit of a different type of conversation than we typically get to have. So thank you for that. And, uh, um, just really appreciate everything you're doing and thanks for kind of, uh, you know, fixing Twitter for us and, uh, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it, this is a lot of fun. So I hope you had a good time too. And, um, I did wish you all the best moving forward. So Likewise. that dad's enough talk. Let's get climbing. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the present father's podcast. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Spotify to catch all of our amazing episodes. We will see you in the next one.